Hi, Mayor Polito here. Hi, Mayor. We are Daisy, live. Can you hear me as well? This is Vince. Yes, I could I could see you and hear you. Thank you. And Councilmember Becerra is here as well. Mayor, if I may make an announcement before um, taking roll call. Um, I'd Go like ahead. To, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, for any member of the public who'd like to make a comment on an item on the agenda for the special meeting, may take this time now to call 669-900-9128, meeting ID 315-965-149-POUND when prompted. Once the callers entered the meeting, they will be placed on hold and their microphone will be muted in accordance with the council procedures. Calls will not be accepted after the public comment session begins. Callers will be prompted to speak in the order received and I will announce the last three digits of your phone number to inform the caller that they've been unmuted. For the record, the caller is encouraged but not required to provide their name and neighborhood of residence. Lastly, a couple of best practices. Callers, please do not mute your phone's microphone. We will do that on our end to prevent any issues when it is your turn to speak. Also, if you're watching this meeting on TV or online, please mute the speakers of that device before making your comments in order to pre prevent audio feedback. And now to take roll call, Councilmember Becerra. Here. Councilmember Mendoza. Here. Councilmember Peñalosa. Here. Councilmember Sarmiento. Here. Councilmember Solorio. Here. Here. Excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Vegas. Here. And Mayor Pulido. Here. We have a quorum. Why don't we go ahead and take a public uh, comment, please, Madam Clerk? Okay. Um, there are speakers that are ready to prov provide their comments. Um, and callers with the last n three numbers zero, uh, 122. Two. You have been unmuted. You have three minutes. Please proceed with your comment. Greetings, Mayor and members of the council. This is Joe Adams, CEO of Discovery Q. I'm calling in as a voice for the nonprofits of the city uh, to please remember the many nonprofit organizations that make up our vibrant city when considering the CARES Act funding. For the Cube, the impact of COVID-19 has been devastating. March 16th, we had to close due to the executive orders of the governor we furloughed 95% of our staff. We in June received PPP funds and when given a chance we were to open, we did, uh, but only 10% of the audience that we typically came to the Cube uh, came. Uh, that lasted for a couple of weeks and then we had to close again for executive orders. With the Cube closed and field trip stopped, we lost our operational revenues. This time we realized that it was going to be for a much, much longer time. So we now laid off instead of furloughed the staff. That's over 200 people, many of which live in Santa Ana. With the remaining PPP funds, we pivoted and created an online platform called Discovery Cube Connect to provide hands-on STEM resources virtually. We created a studio unit to make videos and in two weeks we'll be rolling out online adventures. This was important to us as we wanted to initiate a way to still fulfill our mission, even though the cube buildings were closed and we needed to help the children who are now stuck at home. The PPP funds are now over. We cut most of our expenses, but we still have some, like our debt service from the 2015 expansion, which alone is over $110,000 monthly. A lot of money. And while Although we have sought additional government support, we haven't received any. Our reserves are limited, time's running out, and well before next summer, uh, you know, we're gonna have to face some serious issues if nothing changes. The CARES Act funding can make a significant impact now. It could help extend our digital platform to our city agencies, to the kids in our community. It can be a bridge to get us to a time when we can reopen. And this can be the case for the many other nonprofits in the city as well. So thank you. Thank you for your consideration to include new nonprofits to those you can impact to ensure their good work will continue into the future when COVID is over. Thank you. 
Caller. Next number is, last three numbers are 477. Caller, you may proceed with your comments. You have three minutes. Yeah, Dale Helbig, Santa Ana, Ward 3. I just wanted to call and say uh, thank you to City Council for all the long hours and hard work that you guys are putting in during this COVID uh, pandemic. And I'm sure you guys will put this money, the $28.5 million to good use in the CARES uh, program. So uh, thank you again and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the last three numbers, 877. You have been unmuted. Please proceed with your comment. Hi, this is Lisa Gonzalez Solomon. I'm coming to you once again um, as a resident of Santa Ana as well as the school principal. Um, I'm coming for a couple things one more time. I want to thank you for the support that you have been providing to our residents, families, and students here in Santa Ana. Thank you for looking out for our safety and for caring about our community. I appreciate that you've increased the amount of rental assistance that you're providing um, to our families um, who are much in need. And I do appreciate that you're going out there and helping to feed our families as well. We still have many residents in crisis and we still have more work to do as we continue to see an increase in the number of COVID cases. I come to you asking that um, you're very thoughtful with how the money is spent. I come to you once again asking that we do what we can to provide support to our residents through food, um, through any sort of rental assistance that we can provide. And I'm coming once again to ask you to um, also help with trying to establish some sort of system for, for providing access to distance learning for our students. It's written into the guidelines um, that are provided for the CARES money um, that expenses can be um, money can be utilized to facilitate distance learning, including technological improvements in connection with school closing to enable compliance with COVID-19 precautions. I'm asking you not just for our students, but for our greater community, for our students who are in college, for people who are working remotely, and for our community who needs to have access to telehealth. Um, I know you will make the right decisions. Um, I truly do believe that you will. I've seen what you've been doing. Um, I also want to ask you to look out for our nonprofits and our small businesses because they are the heart of the city. They're, they're the people who employ our local community. They um, Please recognize the work that they have done to pivot, to quickly provide support to families, um, like Latino Health Access to provide additional testing, um, like um, Relampago del Cielo, who turn to providing classes um, virtually for our students like the San Ana Zoo and um, the Discovery Cube, who pivoted to virtual methods to provide programs for our children that they much need while they're at home. Um, thank you for all your support and we hope you take these soon. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three numbers, 825. You have been unmuted. Please proceed with your comment. Hi, good evening, uh, Mayor Polito and council members. My name is Ty Fan, and I'm a resident here in the new Ward 1. And I just wanted to first say thank you to staff for coming up with this budget. Um, but I do want to urge that as we deploy or invest um, almost $6 million of CARES Act spending uh, to deployment of mobile COVID-19 relief workers, that we really give preference and try to hire back our uh, part-time workers who were laid off are SEIU members who have serviced the city for decades and who many of whom are not only workers here in the city but also residents. Uh, they really should be given preference. They are already vetted. They know our city, they know our community, and they would do a fantastic job uh, helping residents, especially during this difficult time. I also would like to urge that our city focus on hiring workers who speak Vietnamese. Uh, we don't have enough of them in our city, and the vast majority of Vietnamese residents live in zip code 92704, which is the zip code with the highest number of COVID cases in the county. So it's very important that we make sure that we do this kind of outreach. Um, I also want to thank staff and the city for looking to have direct monetary assistance for arts relief and small businesses, uh, and particularly for you know, uh, nonprofits like the Heritage Museum of Orange County, which is a fantastic gem here in the city that had to close and that serves 
you know, students here in the city and uh, families here in the city, but is struggling because they do not have enough people visiting the museum at this time with the closures. Uh, finally, I really hope that as we spend more money to expand uh, assistance for renters, that we make sure that it's not just available for um, people who um, are, have citizenship, but it's all residents in the city. Uh, I think it's really important. We are a city of immigrants, a place where we're a melting pot, and so we want to make sure that everybody who needs it have access to it. Um, Otherwise, thank you so much for all the work that you've done, and I really hope that we can put this money to good use. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the last three numbers, 110. Please proceed with your comment. You have been unmuted. Caller with the last three numbers, 110. You may proceed with your comment. You have three minutes. <laughs> Caller with the last three numbers, 268. You have been unmuted. Please proceed with your comment. Hi, this is Yoselinda, and I'm a resident for Ward 2. I'm calling regarding agenda item 68. I'm urging you all to allocate funds from the CARES package of $28.6 million to the Eviction Defense Fund and Rental Relief Fund, which will help prevent houselessness and mass displacement here in Santana. As you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit Santana extremely hard. Family members of my own have suffered from the virus, leaving some of them unable to return to work. And this story is actually very similar to many others in Santana who are unable to work and impacting their ability to pay rent. Having a rental assistance fund will provide immediate aid to folks here in Santana where the majority are renters. I also want to emphasize that the $500,000 rental assistance fund was not enough. Um, the city of Santana provided $3 million for the residents. And I think we should do the same for our community. I urge you to allocate at the very least $4 million from the $28.6 million fund for the rental assistance fund. I also am urging you to allocate funding from the CARES package to the funding of, for the eviction defense fund of at least $2 million. As you all know, um, many renters are left unequipped to navigate the eviction court process because it is just like financially inaccessible. And for those that are undocumented, they are unable to seek community legal aid and this fund will help folks navigate and support them through the eviction process and give them like an equitable chance to fight their case. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. A caller with the last three numbers, 030, you may proceed with your comment. Caller with the last three numbers, 030. You may proceed with your comment. You have been unmuted. Okay. Caller with the last three numbers, 302. You have been unmuted. Please proceed with your comment. Good evening, council members. This is Juan Gonzalez from the Memorial Park neighborhood. I sent out correspondence by email, but I thought it would be wise to also emphasize over the phone a few things. Specifically, I'm calling in order for y'all to really consider unhoused residents when you're thinking about the different applications for the CARES funding. Last year, the county identified 1,769 unhoused people living within Santana, and that is very much an underestimate. Um, but even just looking at that figure alone, I mean, that warrants action. That warrants allocating some dollars. It obviously does not have to be a big bulk of the allocation, but at least some kind of money for things like hygiene supplies, testing, food distribution, outreach services, and all of these to be offered at the different uh, unhoused encampments throughout the city. You know, I think it goes without saying that the CDC has recommended things like shelter in place, uh, you know, really washing your hands regularly. And as we all know, that is impossible for an unhoused person that is without shelter, and even more so now when all the public facilities have been shut down. So, I mean, this is just an outbreak waiting to happen within our city, which is already suffering so much. So I really urge you all to really consider 
the unhoused residents, and I really do mean residents because they are a part of this community as much as I am and as much as all of you are. So just remember them and remember that ultimately they are very reliant on government assistance, uh, especially during this time. And, you know, it just goes without saying that the city's morals is really de dependent on how we treat our most marginalized citizens. And I think the unhoused residents are that within Santana. So please just consider allocating some funds to porta potties, you know, latrine stations, hand sanitizer, because they could mean life or death, literally. Thank you so much. Thank you. Caller with the last three numbers, 655, you have been unmuted. Please proceed with your comment. Yeah, uh, my name is Benacio Chavez, and uh, este mensaje principalmente es para el mayor y los uh, concejales que me están escuchando. Como ustedes ya me conocen, mi nombre es Benancio Chávez y saben que soy vicepresidente de la asociación de French Park Plaza, HOA. En los últimos días hemos estado azo uh, siendo azotados por la delincuencia. Hemos tratado de, de pedir ayuda, de uh, agarrar ayuda de la policía, pero la policía directamente no está haciendo absolutamente nada. Y yo me quisiera pensar que tal vez lo hacen echándole la culpa al, al COVID-19 y que no quieran apresar a los delincuentes que han estado en nuestro vecindario robando nuestra propiedad, haciendo drogas en vía pública, eh, uh, pintando graffiti, eh, dejando basura por donde quiera. Hemos llamado a la, a la policía infinita de veces, hemos dado videos de los atracos de los que hemos sido víctimas y hasta el momento el único que se ha comunicado conmigo es el sargento Hernández eh, quedó de verme hoy y todavía sigo esperándolo eh, aquí en mi casa eh, porque ya estamos cansados ya estamos cansados y hasta donde yo sé le, ustedes le dieron más dinero al, a la policía pero pareciera que ese dinero que le dieron es por menos trabajo que hacen. ¿Y saben por qué la policía no va a actuar de una manera eh, correcta? Es porque eh, ustedes o algunos de ustedes reciben dinero del sindicato de policía para sus campañas. Entonces ustedes no tienen el, eh, el derecho a exigirles que trabajen bien porque... Eh, por eso pagan, para no trabajar, tal vez, o tal vez para no hacer su trabajo como debiera de ser. Por favor, señores concejales, el señor concejal de mi distrito, haga algo, trate de hacer algo. Eh, le roban a la gente pobre, le roban su herramienta de trabajo, le roban sus, su propiedad, sus bicicletas. Ya estamos cansados, ya estamos cansados. La delincuencia ha aumentado drásticamente y la policía sigue sin hacer nada. Por favor, se lo suplico, hagan algo. Y si quieren comunicarse conmigo, mi número de teléfono es, eh, siempre lo han sabido, 714-878-2655. Gracias. Gracias por la llamada. While we wait for the translator, we will allow the next um, uh, person to speak. Caller with the last three numbers, 496. You have been unmuted. Please proceed with your comment. Thank you. This is Valerie Mesqua, Vice President of Santa Unified School Board. Um, Council, I want to thank you for having this meeting tonight and addressing the needs in our city. Um, being a board member, and we've been addressing this for a while now, since March 13th, head on, and it really is a difficult um, time, and you'll be making, you have been making some difficult decisions, and so thank you for your hard work. I would just ask that you consider using the 28.6 million, a portion of it, to join us in the partnership with Latino Health Access and the county in testing and taking care of our families within the city. Because as a school district, we're using our funds that we've received and we've exhausted them um, for the COVID to take care of our families. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we partnered up, you as a council um, and us as a school district, because our constituents are the same people. There are parents and our children. And so I would hope that you would reach out to our superintendent through the city manager and talk about Wi-Fi and not putting it underground, but putting it on our school sites 
citywide Wi-Fi. You can put hotspots on our school sites, on our buses, on city cars. You can put them on uh, many different places that do not cost millions and millions of dollars. And so, again, I would ask that you ask the city manager to reach out to the superintendent and that we join hands together so that we can work to help our community get healthy, get better, and that we can go back to opening our schools and not um, be in distance learning for quite some time because it's not good for our children and it's not good for our community and for our parents. And so thank you for all that you do. And these are hard times. And I know together we can get through this. So thank you uh, and have a nice evening. Thank you. And the translator is here to translate for the last caller. Uh, this message is for the uh, mayor and the city council. As you know, my name is Venancio Chavez, and I'm vice president of the French Park Homeowners uh, Association. And I'm calling about the crime that's happening in our police. We've asked uh, the, the police for help, and the police doesn't do anything. Uh, maybe they're trying to blame uh, their inaction in co on COVID-19, and uh, uh, we don't get any help with what's going on with uh, the robberies, the drug people uh, doing drugs, selling drugs, taggers, and litter littering. So I've called the police before, I've sent them videos, and I haven't received any answer from them, except from Sergeant Hernandez, who was supposed to call me back today, and I'm still waiting for him at home. We are tired of this. We, uh, I understand we give more money to the police, but uh, maybe we give them more money for less work. Uh, you you want to know why the police doesn't uh, want to do the right thing? It's because uh, you, the politicians, get money from the police union, and maybe, uh, they're asking to uh, do less work for more money. So uh, we, we're, maybe they're being paid not to work. Uh, I asked the council, me the council members and my council to do something. Uh, you steal from the, from the people, and we, uh, they're people stealing from, the, from our poor people. They're stealing from uh, the, the work tools. They're stealing from the property. Crime is up, and you, you're not doing anything. And, and, uh, if you want to get back to me, my phone number is 714-878-2655. Thank you. Thank you. And caller with the last three numbers, 683, you have been unmuted. Please proceed with your comment. Hello, my name is Maria Seja. Um, I'm here to request that the city considers allocating $4 million for, to the rental relief fund, as well as $2 million for an eviction defense fund. As we all may know, there's a predicted wave of eviction that will especially hit Santana uh, very hard. Uh, renters make up more than 50% of the population in the city, many of, who, many of who have found themselves unable to pay the rent since the declaration of the COVID-19 state of emergency. We have been quarantined for about over four months now, and tenants have accumulated thousands of dollars of debt in the midst of a financial crisis exacerbated by COVID-19. The rental assistance fund would provide some type of relief as we, as we continue to face a multifaceted pandemic. An accessible eviction defense fund could provide legal assistance beyond the limited resources that are already constrained, especially for undocumented residents that can't seek assistance from legal, from legal aid. Um, also, it could support those who have been illegally evicted because landlords are not following the local eviction moratorium in place. It also doesn't leave tenants alone in a traumatic process like an eviction. Its statistics have shown that 98% of tenants have gone through an, have gone through your eviction court without legal represent, representation. So I think now we should really consider um, using the CARES Act funding to help the most vulnerable residents in our community, especially those who are, have accumulated thousands of dollars of debt and are questioning how they are going to pay this after COVID-19 is declared over, because we all know that even post COVID-19, we're gonna face financial constraints and we need to start thinking of how we're going to prepare for this now, um, instead of dealing with it when it's actually happening. So I ask that you expand the rental relief fund to $4 million and to consider $2 million for an eviction defense fund. Thank you. Thank you, caller. With the last three numbers, 032, you have been unmuted. Please proceed with your comment. Hello, my name is Nathaniel Greenside, Ward 5 resident, 
and I am not in support of item 60A. I'm, I'm not fully against it as a concept, rather I'm not in favor of the proposed expenditures. I am thankful for some of the work that the city has done during the time of the pandemic. To start though, I will share my discontent at the fact that this special meeting of city council regarding the specifics of a substantial amount of money for COVID-19 pandemic relief was only advertised to the public less than 24 hours ago. On top of that, the standard city council meeting time of 5 p.m. was pushed back an hour, which pushed back the e-commerce cutoff time by an hour, hardly giving residents a chance to review the proposed relief fund expenditures. Moving on, I think that the line item of $3 million for both tenant relief and child care is an injustice to residents. While I don't have kids of my own, and not just because rents are too high and my income is nowhere near allowing for the suggested less than 30% of pay towards housing costs, I do have friends who have children, and we all know that childcare is expensive and deserves its own line item in the amount of $3 million. Tenant rent relief also deserves its own line item of $3 million. Anaheim did it, and so can we. I applaud the city's efforts to find ways to ease tenant struggles in this pandemic. However, tenants were struggling before the pandemic and will continue to struggle long after. A $3 million tenant rent relief fund will not only ensure community stability now and for the longer term, but also for mom and pop landlords here in Santa Ana. Without it, as we saw in 2008, unpaid rent leads to eviction, making it harder for tenants to find new places to live. Loss of rental income means higher rent to make up for losses, which leads to vacancies and eventually foreclosures for mom and pop landlords. Then giant corporations gobble up all of the housing units for sale, making it harder for individuals and families to participate in property ownership, in addition to decreasing housing quality overall as well as furthering community instability, making it easier for outside developers to destabilize our city in their pursuit of profit over people, which is what some present council members have always advocated for, via tax breaks in place at the federal and state level, in addition to easing the housing opportunity ordinances requirements to develop affordable housing, will have long-term disastrous effects for all of San Ana's residents. Additionally, there needs to be a $1 million eviction defense fund. Of those who appear in court to their eviction cases, 98% of them show up without legal representation. With Santa Ana being the hardest hit by COVID-19 in the county and arguably the state, with Santa Ana households being over 50% renters, low income, multi-generational, multi-lingual, essential workers at the risk of contracting the virus, Santa Ana residents need funds to share a fair chance at fighting an eviction case in court. Because of this, many residents cannot left. afford a representation on their own, and some community organizations which offer legal assistance, such as the Legal Aid Society, require that participants be documented, which is a privilege not many afforded, afforded to not many of our residents here in Santana. With our local ordinance expiring at the end of September, in addition to state eviction protection also near in termination, Nate, your time is the up. upcoming wave of eviction will take. I hope you all remain well and have. Thank you. Thank you. There are no other callers. Um, I only want to also announce that we did receive three co email comments tonight. One, a Santa Ana resident requested allocate, allocation for CARES fund for services for the unhoused. And then two Santa Ana residents um, requested for allocation care funds for eviction and rental relief services. And that is all we have, Mayor. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, my uh, uh, bad, but uh, I just want us all to stand up for a moment where we may be. And I want to, us to do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. So if you could all stand at this time. Ready? Begin. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, States of America, America and, and to, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands. One nation, One nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Thank you for that. Um, now I'm going to turn matters over to our city manager to give us a presentation on all the hard work that um, uh, you know staff has been doing. Um, and I also want to take a moment to thank the council. Uh, but especially I want to thank my fellow mayors as well because um, the big city mayors are really 100% responsible for this money. This 28 million 
would not have come um, to our city were it not for the mayors um, across the state uh, sticking together uh, and becoming a broken record, uh, you know, for over a month, just talking to, you know, senators, uh, you know, folks, the governor, uh, just anybody that we could get to listen. Um, and thank God, you know, this money is here. Um, there's still some things I want to continue to try to change. One of them is that the money is coming in very slowly. Um, I think the manager may cover this in her presentation, but it's coming in only uh, a sixth at a time. So we'll get uh, three checks of one sixth. And then at that time, the state will review how we're doing and they want to reserve the right to take half the money, about $14 million, and potentially reallocate it to other state needs. So the 28 million is not in our hands. Uh, we're gonna have to continue to fight for it and push for it and um, insist that it all come here. It's our, our fair share is a big city with a lot of problems, a lot of issues. Um, really this money should have come in a bigger number from the County of Orange because they received $554 million back in uh, March in the early days, um, and they, you know, have very, very little has gone to um, uh, to cities. Very little of that original 554 million. But look, I, I don't know what we can do about that other than continue to advocate on our behalf. Um, and right now, we can talk about this 20 million. Hopefully, it all comes. And um, I know we need it desperately. There's a lot of need in the city right now, and we need to use it as judiciously as possible. So with that, um, I'd like to turn things over to our city manager, please. Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for those opening remarks. Um, I know you're all aware that the most pressing issue facing us at the moment is COVID-19. This pandemic has caused a great demand for your leadership and city assistance to address a health crisis at a time when our resources are declining. I am pleased that we do have some good news in the front thanks to a lot of people's lobbying efforts um, and we hopefully will receive the full 28.6 million, but you're correct, it is being doled out one sixth at a time. But in anticipation of the funding, we have formed an interdepartmental task force working diligently behind the scenes to implement your direction on a number of programs for our communities with these funds. In the presentation, I want to talk a little bit about the magnitude of the virus, particularly the disparate impact it's having on our community, how we've responded to date, and then most importantly, our proposed plan to deploy the needed federal funding. I'm sure most of you are already aware that the healthcare agencies, that's Orange County Healthcare Agency, they have a website that reports information daily. It provides the number of cases in the county, it provides additional breakdowns by city and zip codes, but I wanna take a step back and talk about other information about our community that unfortunately is contributing to rapid growth of COVID-19. Our per capita income sits at 19,500, Almost 20% of our community live at or below the poverty level. We are a very high dense city and we have a large number of essential frontline workers that live in our community. More and more information is coming forward that supports that our type of community is the one that is being hit the hardest by this virus. The total cases in the US are approaching 5 million and our state represents a little over 10% of the country's cases. At the county level, our case count is second only to LA County and continues to grow daily. Our county is one that is on a watch list and as a result, we've been under additional restrictions by the governor's office. In our city alone, we are exceeding 7,000 cases. We do have the highest case count in the county, followed by Anaheim. The majority of other cities in our county have well below 1,000 cases. Looking at our city, the majority of cases are located in four zip code areas, 92701, 92703, 92704, and 92707. These areas will be our first targeted areas for our CARES programming. Before I get into the proposed spending plan, I do want to highlight some of the unprecedented actions under your leadership that we've already taken to date in response to COVID-19. 
Following the governor's order back in March, which declared the state of emergency, our city declared a local emergency. This declaration provided the opportunity for, for potential state and federal resources and granted special powers to the city manager as the director of emergency services, specifically the ability to issue executive orders. At this time, the city was also required to comply with the governor's stay in order, so we immediately had to modify the way that citywide operations were conducted. At one point, we did have to send over 600 employees home as a result of mandated closures. To date, I have issued 10 executive orders uh, to alleviate the impacts of COVID-19 on our community. The first one that was issued was to prevent an increase in our homeless population and preserve public health. This was a moratorium on evictions and suspension of water shutoffs. The second executive order addressed the negative impacts for city services being limited due to the statewide shutdown and provide additional relief for late fees, deadlines, tickets, and rent increases. Next, in the absence of any order from the county's health officer, I issued my third executive order to require facial coverings for essential workers and strongly encourage that businesses require all customers to wear them, and we also encourage stores to designate times for vulnerable populations to shop. The fourth order extended my first order as the situation was certainly not improving. Executive order number five was to assist our local businesses that were struggling to hang on by permitting operations to spill out onto sidewalks and parking lots. The last two executive orders were once again to provide relief to tenants that may have experienced a loss of income, health care coverage, ability to pay for basic needs, further increasing the strain on local community clinics, shelters, and food banks. Um, not listed are Executive Order 6, 7, and 8. Those all dealt with establishing a curfew in light of known information concerning potential civil unrest. So where are we at now? Currently in the state, all Californians, it is about mask, 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 and I know, Mayor, you've, you've done a great job at educating people on the importance of mask, but all Californians today are required to wear masks. If you leave your house and you cannot maintain social distancing of six feet, you're to have a mask on. Unfortunately, restaurants, retailers, hair salons, gyms, places of worship, and some other locations are only allowed to operate outdoor or for pickup and delivery. Um, this is unique to only a handful of counties in the state because of certain criteria that the governor's office has been monitoring. Our public schools are to be distant learning only. Um, however, they did post just as of yesterday a waiver that a school can seek approval for the governor's office to do some in-class room instruction. And there also has been posted new guidance involving youth sports. Malls, museums, and zoos, those large-scale gatherings are still prohibited and probably will be so for the foreseeable future. The state is continuing to monitor our county closely on five data sets, and we're still failing two of the five data sets. So the ones that we're failing are the cases per thousand. The goal is to be below 25, and we are at 115. That is a substantial decline from where we were about a week ago when we had exceeded 200 per thousand. The positive test rate goal is to be under 8%, and our county currently is at 8.6. And then there's a three-day average increase in hospitalized patients, and the goal is to be under 10%. We're currently meeting that. The most recent three-day average was actually a decline. Another data set that's measured is maintaining at least 20% of ICU beds to be available, and we currently have 34% of ICU beds available maintaining at least 25% of ventilators in the county available, and we're at 54%. So, as mentioned before, the positive news is through significant efforts, our city has, is finally going to receive, hopefully, the entire amount of the 28.6 of the federal funds to address COVID. These federal dollars in the past have been directed only to state and counties. Um, the state did pass through to cities and counties over 500,000 population, which did not include our city, but after the significant lobbying efforts, the state has committed funding to cities of our size. And we have been very hard working behind the scenes to put it to work. This next slide is an overview of the 28.6 million that we anticipate receiving over the next five months. Um, obviously, the expenditures, they have to all have to do with COVID-19. There's some very strict U.S. Department of Treasury regulations that we have to follow, and currently they have to be spent by the end of December. 
The nine spending buckets that are listed above, I'm going to go through each one of those so you don't have to spend a lot of time looking at that slide. I'll walk you through all of them. So our first priority is deploying the resources out into the hardest hit communities, a mobile-based outreach program. For the mobile outreach strategy, this includes a caravan going right into the heart of the community with education materials, mobile testing, distribution of CARES PPE kits, and providing access to the number of monetary assistance programs we've lined up. Um, so you can see on this slide, we've branded ourselves at Santa Ana CARES, and there's an example of what the care kit would look like. We hope to have that stuff with a mask, uh, disinfectant, and other items. This place-based strategy is intended to provide a one-stop shop for the ease of our residents' access. Using GIS data, we've designed the locations to match not only the hardest hit areas, but specifically the locations with the most dense residential units. It's a little hard to see on this slide, but we actually have maps that show bubbles, and the size of the bubble indicates the density of the residential area. So our focus will be where there are the largest bubbles. The timing of the mobile caravan will follow street sweeping to ensure we have adequate street space to set up, and all protocols that are recommended by the CDC will be in place to protect the residents served, but also the relief workers. In addition, to, in addition, the moving outreach will also have stationary care kit locations such as parks and possibly a partnership with a local, local grocery store. So when we're out doing the mobile outreach, we will hand out the kits, but we're also going to have other fixed locations that individuals can avail themselves to those kits as well. Part of the mobile resource will have a freestanding COVID-19 testing unit. Um, we are in the process of vetting a couple different vendors to provide this service. We're looking for a vendor that has an FDA authorized kit and uses medically trained technicians. Uh, we also believe it's very important for our residents that there is no need for advanced scheduling or appointments. We want it to be able to be a walk-in, but we don't want it to have to be a drive-through with a car. We want it to be very simple for residents to get access. Another thing that we've secured a contract for is a 24-7 nurse hotline. So to provide responsible health care answers for our residents of our city that, are, that need any questions answered relative to COVID-19. We have found a company that can do a trilingual nurses hotline. They can actually do up to 200 different languages. But the residents use in three different languages can confidentially seek answers from a trained medical professional on everything COVID related. Uh, the only qualifier is that they have a Santa Ana address. That's it. There's nothing to do with insurance on it. We have a large number of direct monetary assistance programs planned. Um, we have been very fortunate in the past to provide some of these same types of monetary assistance to our residents, but this funding does give us an opportunity to add a lot more revenue to the programs. So one of the first one is the rental assistance program, and we're proposing a 2.7 proposed allocation. And I know one of the callers mentioned we should do more in this area. Not included in this presentation is all the other funds that we've put towards rental assistance, and in total there have been on top of this 2.7 that we're proposing, there's already been another 7 million relative to rental assistance. So our city is in excess of the city of Anaheim. We're approaching $10 million in programming for rental assistance. One thing that's extremely unique about our approach to the rental assistance program, our housing shop has been very creative in this, and we've proposed a partnership with the rental properties so that we can negotiate directly with the landlords, hopefully pay back a discounted amount for the tenant's rent, um, and let the landlord forgive something. We believe that receiving something is better than not receiving anything. And then in return for this, we want those landlords or their property owners to agree to not evict any of the program participating residents for a minimum of a period of six months from the agreement. We believe that this private-public partnership will relieve the tenants of their back rent that has accumulated since April 1st and give them peace of mind. We heard you loud and clear on a potential need for childcare assistance, so we've carved out 250000 
Uh, the program will be a fixed amount per child, and it's going to be to ensure that the working parents that have children under 12 that cannot attend school in person can be cared for within their home. So we're still working out the details of this program, but we do think that it will, it's critical for individuals to continue if they are working parents, and because of COVID, their, their child can't attend school. Utility assistance. Um, we've heard from the community that there's many. We also know as a water provider that we have a number of accounts that are delinquent on our water bills, that there is a great need for just the basics for bill paying for utility assistance. We're proposing about $2 million allocation to this, and it would consist of $500 assistance payment for residents to apply to their delinquent water, trash, electric, and gas bills. Continuing on with the small business grants, this is an area um, that you have had us provide a lot of assistance for in the past. This is additional money that can go to small business grants, and we heard very loud and clear we're proposing it to go to Santa Ana businesses and nonprofits that are for the businesses. It's small businesses with 25 or less, but we also have a program where other larger nonprofits could be included in it. Um, the funding, the monetary assistance can be used by those businesses for rent, utilities, payroll, marketing, uh, and a number of di different uh, expenditures that they have to keep them afloat during this time. Uh, we did add an arts relief program as requested by you. We propose a half a million dollar allocation, and it's aimed at really three different. It's aimed at arts-related nonprofit organizations, and it's aimed at micro-related art businesses, and also individual um, grants to individual artists. Temporary housing and hotel vouchers. This, we heard of the need from this from some of the fabulous clinics that work in our community that uh, some of the fastest spreading of COVID-19 is relative to transmission within households. And that's because oftentimes if one family member becomes positive, it runs through the household to the other family members. So we have secured hotel vouchers so that we can assist the residents for isolation. So whether it's us taking the healthy individuals out of the house and putting them somewhere else, separated from the individual that tests positive, it's um, all intended to reduce the household transmission rate. Education and outreach. So as part of all of the programs, the targeted programs that I just talked about, the overarching necessity is the education and the outreach. And I know we talked about this before, that um, the residents that we really need to deliver the message to probably aren't the ones that are looking at our social media accounts. So we needed to go back to some grassroots efforts on ways that we could communicate. So we mentioned before the concept of COVID ambassadors, COVID-19 relief workers, a dedicated hotline. We plan to, in addition, this is the nurse's hotline is solely for healthcare questions, but we're going to have a dedicated city hotline as well for people to call to inquire about any of these types of programs. Um, we are in the process of publishing a resource guide which lists all of the available programs and how they can be accessed. We're going to be doing program flyers. We've designed door hangers, so what the door hangers are going to be used for is we want to deploy those in the neighborhood that, that will indicate when the mobile resource caravan is coming to that neighborhood, the date and time. And uh, digital signs, you might see some more digital signs up that we usually use for construction notices. You might see them up in the middle of the street for COVID-related messages. And of course, we will continue to, um, to utilize social media as well. The digital signage, we have, a, we have a sample. We are in the process of procuring some new digital signboards. And then, uh, on a lighter note, this was a, an ask of our mayor. He wanted to do a mask design contest. So help us design a Santa Ana face mask. So we are going to have a contest. Uh, it will be done through, uh, similar to what Daisy has done in the past for the census 2020. But for the top, I don't know, top 50 are we going to do? So for the top 50, there's a chance to win a $50 gift card. And then from the top winning designs, we'll, we'll pick the award-winning one, and we will actually have masks printed up with that artist design on them. So those entries, you'll be seeing stuff come out on this soon. The entries have to be ma mailed in by September 18th to enter into the drawing. 
Sanitization, so as you know, we already have had us doing a lot of additional cleaning at all the city facilities where your employees work, but one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to expand that to sanitize high-risk areas throughout the community. Um, we were very fortunate we found a company located right here in Santa Ana that's been in business for a number of years that is a chemical company. So we've entered into agreement with them and we are going to do sanitization services. They're going to uh, supply us a special formulated disinfection, which disinfectant, which cures, or not cures, but does kill the COVID bacteria. And we want to go through the city and sanitize high traffic, the public areas. This would be things like our bus shelters, the crosswalk buttons, other high traffic areas. And next, we, heard, we have heard from local community clinics. Right now, they are, they are very, they're overwhelmed. Um, several of them have received some county money and they are, they're working really hard but they have voiced some need for additional monetary assistance to help with maybe getting more medical profession, professionals into their clinics to help meet the demand. So we're in the process of reaching out to those that serve our residents to see what we can do to help them. And then early on we had talked about the importance of data modeling, and this has to do with partnering with UCI where we could potentially do some expanded serology test and determine the prevalence of COVID-19 in our community. And what that would tell us is where we could potentially have a hot spot or where we don't have anything to worry about. So um, the more information, the better prepared that we could be. And then local government COVID-19 related cost. I know you guys are painfully aware of uh, the significant loss of revenue. The government, we have experienced as a result of COVID, but we also have incurred millions and millions of dollars of expenses uh, just conducting the city businesses and mainly shifting from our fundamental services to provide different services uh, related to COVID and also all of the expenditures and the retrofitting that we've had to do between personal protective equipment, social distancing, plexiglass, additional janitorial cleaning, and um, overtime, a lot of costs. So we did reserve some of the money to cover the city government cost. And uh, these are just some examples that you may have noticed them or not noticed them. The, the increased amount of the plexiglass barriers. Uh, we also have invested substantially and plan to do a little more investment into our IT. One of the things that we quickly learned when we had to shut down public access is how to provide services um, using IT. So some, there are some good things that have come out of that. I know one council member is going to be <laughs> extremely happy with it, uh, but we have we've developed some apps. We're using apps to make appointments to come to the permit counter where you're waiting out in the parking lot and you text when you get here and you don't come in until they're ready to see you. So we're continuing to do public facility enhancements so we can keep businesses, keep our business open in light of COVID. The last bucket that you'll see on that summary sheet or that you'll see in the body of the staff report has to do with a, a revenue recovery and a reserve. So as the mayor mentioned, this amount of money is coming from CARES, which was federal legislation. Uh, right now, uh, the federal government is debating, there's two competing proposals. Uh, I don't know when, they can, when they'll make a decision or not, but in them, there is the ability if approved, where the local jurisdictions such as our city that received CARES money, we may be able to have a longer period of time to spend it, up to 90 days after the end of the current fiscal year. But more importantly, they may allow the CARES money to replace lost revenue for governments. In the initial CARES Act, that was not allowed. It was not permissible to use that money for revenue replacement. So we have a holding piece on 25% because under the current legislation under consideration, you could use up to 25% for revenue recovery. So we've set aside roughly $7 million for that. We hope we will find out by the end of September if there is any action taken by the federal government. Um, the two competing measures right now, there is one that does provide additional monies to cities, counties, and states, and one that provides uh, no money to city, counties, and states. But we're hoping at the minimum, at least we might get an extension and be able to use some of that for revenue recovery. As you know, our, our current fiscal year budget, we do have an $18 million shortfall, so we, we definitely could use the $7 million in that revenue recovery. 
And the last slide, this is the interdepartmental task force that's been the creative geniuses behind all of these programs that I was able to present to you tonight. So I wanted to give a special thanks to all of those employees that have been working very hard. We have a weekly Zoom call where we do the status updates on everything. So tonight, what we're asking for in the staff report is really three different actions. The first one is we are asking for you to appropriate the full amount of $28.6 million. Of course, we will be carefully spending it and monitoring it and making sure that if they stop the funding that we haven't overspent it. But because of the short timetable, we're seeking the appropriation of the entire amount. And then secondly, we'd like to get your buy-in on this spending plan and the programs. There's still a lot of tweaking to be done. We can make minor adjustments, but we would like to get the green light to move forward with everything. And then the third item is to grant me authorization to make adjustments. So currently, I can't move money between departments. And what we're doing with the CARES money, because it is special revenue subject to DOT, US DOT regulations, we're putting it in a special revenue fund. And if you look at your staff report on the last page under the fiscal impact, we've done our best to allocate it to which department we think is going to be paying which bills. Um, but it might, cha it might change. We might have some programs that are more popular than others, and one department may have to expend more than the others. So I'm seeking authorization to just to be able to move the funding between the departments, not outside of the fund whatsoever, just between the departments to pay the bills. So those are the three recommended actions that are before you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Mayor, I have a question for the uh, city manager. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, but first of all, thank you for that presentation, uh, Madam City Manager. And now I want to hear from uh, all council members and uh, and then bring it back uh, uh, for consideration uh, towards the end of the discussion. Go ahead, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Madam City Manager and staff, thank you so much for your hard work on this. I, I know it took a lot. And uh, <clears throat> I know we're under a timetable on this. One of the things I wanted to ask or something I wanted to ask is, you know, we want to support our businesses here in downtown. And uh, <clears throat> I've been hearing from the owners in downtown, uh, the restaurants, that they do better um, with the sales and people um, dining outside than they are inside. So um, I believe they could use some help with uh, having it look a little more professional when they dine outside. And I think this is a good idea if we could allocate some funds specifically for that because um, I think it would help a great deal. We do want to help the downtown uh, restaurants and uh, we want to keep them going. And that's some of the feedback that I, I hear from the owners. So I was hoping if we could address that issue and put some funding towards that. And then that's one. And second is uh, Wi-Fi. Do we are we offering any Wi-Fi for the residents or the students um, for re regarding schooling? Or um, I'm not sure if I missed it here somewhere. Um, so I just spoke to the superintendent of Santa Ana Unified School District the other day, and he has requested our assistance through the libraries to help with some distant learning programs. So I'm going to be working with him on that. With the Wi-Fi, we did increase our number of hotspots that we have available at our libraries. Uh, one of the requests early on, there was an understanding that the city might have had a Wi-Fi infrastructure backbone throughout our city where we could actually be an internet and a Wi-Fi provider, which we, we don't have that. Um, we have forwarded on all the information that we have found on potential grants available. And then also I know we received some information on some of the different providers in California that are giving extremely low discounts for to encourage the distant learning. So we have been working with the school district on it. And I do anticipate that um, some of this money will go to meet what they were requesting for the distance, distance learning, which will assist in that area. Awesome. Thank you very much. I think every little bit helps. Uh, during these uh, very trying times. Thank you very much again to you for your leadership and all the staff that worked on this um, report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, this Thank is uh, Councilmember Penaloza, if I, if I can. Go ahead, Councilmember Penaloza, go ahead. Thank you, sir. And um, I want to say, Madam Manager, that I, I agree with what uh, Mayor Pro Tem Villegas brought up 
in regards to the the businesses. I noticed that in the section where we're going to be allocating money for uh, small business grants and recovery, it says a uh, list of things of what they can and cannot use the money for, uh, PPE equipment and um, other, I was trying to find the page it was on, um, and uh, it, it's, oh, here it is, it's eligible business expenses include rent, utilities, payroll, marketing, personal protective equipment, cleaning and disinfecting supplies, inventory services, and technology to automate systems or to allow for telecommuting activities of employees. One thing that a large expense that they've been having is building these outdoor uh, patios that are very popular with the public and, and like the Mayor Pro Tem mentioned, uh, have seen, they've seen a, a higher drive for, for the, and more clientele with these outdoor seating patios, but they, they do cost money and they do, it is an investment that they're, whether it's temporary or not, we don't know that yet, but it, it is something that they're doing. I know we're offering public streets, uh, to, to, to a, a lot of public street space to do this, but in any way where we could allow for that flexibility where they could use this money to invest into their outdoor um, seating areas as part of an expense, I'd be supportive of that. And um, another thing that I noticed with the money here is that when it comes to utility uh, expenses for the public, uh, which is also I'm supportive of. One of the utility, you know, they could pay for, you know, water, trash, electric, and gas bill as uh, assistance. But, you know, we don't allow for uh, the internet and cable and cell phone bills are not eligible. I agree with the cable and the cell phone, but again, we got to remember that there are thousands of kids that are now at home, and the internet is, I think, uh, now in, in in 2020, I mean, if you don't have internet, you 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 know you you might as well just not try to do anything because if you don't have it, you really can't do anything. And everything, everyone pushes you to do things online, whether it's uh, virtual learning, as we're seeing with schools, or unemployment uh, applications. And um, I know that my mom, with her medical uh, stuff, they're pushing her to do do it via the app, via internet, and it's like. And, and to Teladoc, it's all internet-based. So it is, I think, a necessity for us to also allow the public and allow for internet bills to be considered as part of this uh, conversation, especially since we're looking at ways where we can provide uh, city Wi-Fi hotspots for, for members of the public, additional hotspots. I know Brian in the library has, is doing a great job at expanding that inventory, but I'd be supportive to see the internet bill as be considered as part of these uh, assistant payments for residents. And with the, um, there was uh, the, the social media, I, I'm happy, you know, like I, I, you know, anytime that there's social media uh, push for education and outreach, I'm very supportive of it, but we also got to remind that I know Daisy Perez in our in your city manager's office is doing a great job at at the census outreach, but the sponsoring of content I've said this before I've said it to PD I've said I've said it to to city manager's office parks parks and rec that sponsored content is going to be the way to go if we really want the average person out there to see this um, anything that we put out just because you know we've all I see the city of Santa Ana Facebook. Uh, posts that we share, you know, we have upwards of 15,000 uh, likes on our Facebook page, but when it comes to individual posts, we're lucky if we get three or four or five people that, that see them. And it's because you, people that don't often engage with city, uh, the city Facebook page or posts are not going to be, are not going to see it because of the algorithms that these companies, we got to remember that Social media is a great tool, but they are private businesses, and they are in the business to make money. And if you really want something shared and, and visible to a lot of people, we're going to have to put dollars behind it in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in social media uh, sponsoring. Uh, last thing, um, with slide 16, the map 
where we're going to be doing the um, outreach with the COVID care kits. I uh, simply don't understand. I don't. I don't know what you know. If we're using the same the data from the registrar of voters or voting patterns, um, Central Santa Ana. I, I know that this is saying that these are the hot spots with COVID, but even uh, the majority part of Central Santa Ana. I live right off of Bristol on Edinger. I know there's a there's a location identified south by Memorial Park, but that whole area north of me is very very dense, and we we identify the areas as being the hotspots where there's the most cases on the following page um, by zip code, but we got to remember that in the very dense areas just north of where I live, very poor community, very dense, they might not have access to testing, and that's why we don't see those numbers allocated to that part of the city. But I'm not seeing any, at least the map on slide 16 looks like that. I'm not sure if, it's, if there's other data available, but again, we're ignoring that whole central part of Santa, well, at least it seems like we are going can, off of this map. Yeah, I can clarify. This, this is just an example of what the map looks like. We intend to hit the hot spots first with the outreach, which are those zip codes that have the highest positive test counts, which are provided by OC Healthcare Agency. The maps we've created internally, and it is based on the number of residential units located. So we're not ignoring the rest of the city. We will be visiting all of the dense areas throughout the whole city with the mobile care of that. So okay, that's and, and that's important that we make sure that we let the public know that and, and point that out because, again, I live in that area of town, and I could tell you that it's pretty dense, and there are a ton of people uh, in that part of town, and whether it's, you know, uh, nuisance abatement lawsuits or or quality of life team or um, COVID testing and just voting, I don't see the, the outreach uh, ever going. It's just we just keep ignoring, that's what it seems like, that we just keep ignoring Central Santa Ana. On slide four, uh, when we have the, the areas identified with the most cases, it's the south, the north, the, the, the southwest, uh, the, the areas where are known to be more affluent in the city and more aware and people vote more. So that whole area, uh, if we look at Ward 5, most of Ward 4, and most of Ward, the new Ward 6, you know, you don't, you, I don't see um, locations identified there as uh, having COVID cases, which I know is not the case. And um, that is... Uh, it for the concerns that I had. The only other one that I wanted to mention is the hotel vouchers is I think is a, is a great um, expense that we're gonna be uh, allocating money for. Um, I, wanna, I want us to keep in mind that if we do offer these hotel vouchers, they, are, they probably need to be for seven to 14 days, uh, which I'm, I'm thinking the average hotel rate, it goes anywhere for 100 bucks a night maybe uh, maybe I'm thinking the Marriott. Maybe if we keep them at the Red Roof Inn, we we could um, offer a lot less. But um, it, it, it 300 grand. We got to remember that a lot of our families do live in one bedroom apartments, families of four or five, and you know there isn't anywhere in their homes where people could isolate. Uh, so that's an important uh, area that we must also consider. And with the social. Um, with the learning, uh, I forget the term you mentioned, with those distant. distant learning, is that something that we're working in partnership with the school district? Because we have two libraries um, as of today that where we could offer social, uh, distant learning. And I want to remind all of us that the school district does have numerous school sites with numerous libraries where we could make sure that this is a partnership where we're not taking the full responsibility of having distant learning in our libraries and also you know, offering resources if we need to to the numerous sites that are now empty where they could also do a distance learning. I wanna make sure it's equitable and that it's an actual partnership versus just the city is taking on this role. So um, those are, are my 
uh, comments for now. We'll see if more arise. Madam City Manager, if you have anything. So, yes, Council Member, Mr. absolute Mayor. partnership. We did uh, the conversation with just this Let her week. answer, and then I'll call you, Councilor Carmian. But go ahead. It was just that the conversation with the superintendent was just this week, and it was intended to be that a partnership of where our libraries can partner with the school district and we can enhance the distant learning. But also, while you were speaking, we wanted to show you, although we gave a snippet of a map within the presentation, this is the citywide map that shows the bubble that I was talking about and you can see from the the legend that the bubbles indicate the size of the number of units that are present so you can see some of the other areas throughout the whole city that we'll be focusing on that's good Madam City Manager. and ju just these maps are very important um, I know that might, some might not really think they are but when we make these maps public as a public record attachment attached to staff reports attached to available to the public, the public sees these maps and, you know, even though this is just, I want to say a brief summary on behalf of uh, the COVID task force here in the city, we want to make sure that we don't put out maps like this that could be a little misleading to the public and, and you know, me myself that I live in the central part of Santa and I could see that and say, well, what about us, you know? So it's, it's important that we um, have these available and have when it comes to maps, because people like pictures and symbols and maps, and they'll see that immediately and jump to conclusions like I just did. But um, I, I trust you, and I believe that, sh that, that this is... We have a map for every zip code. That <laughs> this is not the case. So um, we got to make sure that when we release these maps that they show actual uh, information and, and data that we're going to be using. Uh, council Member, let me just intervene, then I'll go to Council Member... Uh, Vince Sarmiento, the real problem here is the county. They won't give us information. All they will tell you is how many cases per zip code. We really ought to insist at least by precinct so that within a zip code we know where the hotspots are, but the county refuses to cooperate with us. So we're in the dark. As we start doing our serology tests, we're probably going to have better data than they do as to what is really going on in the city. And then as we do contact tracing on our own, we'll also have, I think, better data and information. Uh, and this goes to the whole question about the healthcare official and you know the job that the county is doing, or, and this is actually not doing, but that's, that's the problem that we're having, is well, getting the data. That, make, that, that makes sense. And yeah. thank you for speaking up, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to, before I forget, to thank you. Uh, I got, want to give credit where credit is due. And you were uh, a huge force in, in getting this money for us. So thank you, uh, on you and the other uh, mayors of the large 10 cities. Uh, because without you guys' help, we really wouldn't have had these funds available. So thanks. Thank you for the thank you. Uh, Council Member Vince Sarmiento, please. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, look, I want to, you know, I want to begin by saying that, you know, I'm glad we had that opening discussion about where we are as a city because, you know, we're certainly in the, you know, in the second most impacted county in the state and the most impacted city in the county. So that doesn't put us in a really enviable position. Um, we have four of the highest zip codes in the entire county. So we are very, very impacted by this. And um, let me begin by thanking, you know, all of you, my colleagues, because we're having this meeting as a special meeting when we didn't didn't have to. And I think it's important enough that all of us felt that it was, um, you know, it was it was important that we didn't wait till the following meeting uh, to start talking about this. And, you know, let's just remind ourselves this all started on March 15th. So we're now just getting around to dealing with um, some additional relief uh, more than what we've done in the past. Um, actually putting some um, relief, COVID relief uh, measures out there uh, in addition to the rental, uh, the moratorium on rental evictions, some of the assistance that we've provided in the past, but this is really uh, to address the, uh, the virus. And I know all of us have been working in our own spheres trying to get this moving. It's really sad. I think it goes, I think I, you know, I, I need to reiterate what the mayor said, which is we shouldn't even be in this position had there been good leadership from the county this would have been well, well ahead of us. This would have been done. Um, this would have, the data would have been there. The funds would have been there. The, the, the attention 
but yet we're, I think, um, look, it's, I feel like we're on a sinking ship uh, because we have such poor leadership at the county and they are the vested agency and we need to remind ourselves they are the vested agency to be responsible for these social services when it comes to public health. So we give them that authority and the, um, and the public gives them that authority, but we're basically having to fend for ourselves, as I said before. So um, uh, thank you to staff for um, uh, providing the presentation and to pre for presenting this. I know we had a, a version of this presented to us a couple of meetings back, and I think my comments were then this is a very, very good start. And I think we're addressing things that, um, you know, I know are very important. So I'm not going to repeat what others said. I'm just going to um, hopefully, you know, echo some of that. Um, but let me begin by just uh, talking about a couple of adjustments and then things that are not going to be cost, um, that'll be cost neutral, but maybe some things to consider as we um, talk about some things. And um, one of them is on the rental assistance. So I just want it to be clear or actually, um, you know, I know on, in the line item on slide 13, the rental assistance shows an amount of 2.7 uh, million, but that is in addition to what we've already allocated through our community development block grants of uh, 800,000. So we're looking more at about a 300, or excuse me, 3.5 million um, allocation for rental assistance. So that's one clarity I wanted to make. And also in that same, um, in, that, in those same line items, I think, um, we have a couple of numbers flipped on slide 13. It shows that the small business grants uh, will be receiving uh, 500,000 and the arts relief program is going to be receiving 2.5 million. So I hate to break it to the artists out there. We love you, but you know, I think those two things actually uh, were intended to be flipped. So two and a half million goes to the um, small business grants and half a million goes to the, um, to the arts, uh, both of which are important um, for what everybody had mentioned already. What I wanted to just call some attention to was um, just things that are non-cost uh, related, um, but maybe things that could help us out with respect to our um, employees that we've had to separate with. Um, I know that there are some line items here for compliance efforts, um, and I think we've called them you know, ambassadors, and folks who are gonna be doing outreach to residents, to businesses. Um, and I know that um, you know, we're going to be uh, needing people that are going to be doing the actual boots on the ground work. And to the extent we can use and deploy our uh, part-time employees that we've had to separate with for this, um, please, uh, I know that they probably have the first right of refusal when it comes to any opportunities. And I know, Madam City Manager, you and I've had this discussion several times. Thank you for, you know, making sure that, you know, these opportunities when they come to COVID-related support um, and work, we offer it to those that we've had to separate with. Um, and even some things that we're actually doing now, I know we have some security staff that I've seen around the um, around City Hall that are taking temperatures and making sure people are coming in and they're wearing their masks. Maybe even those things, you know, go to our part-time employees rather than outsourcing those out. And really any other COVID related responsibility that we have to engage with or we are presently engaging with that we contract out. I think it's important that we keep those things in house right now um, because it serves a lot of purpose. As somebody said before, uh, these part-time employees are people who've not only worked with our organization, they've been vetted, uh, they've gone through training and to repurpose them for other functions, I think wouldn't be too difficult and uh, they're familiar with the organization. So that that's one thing. When, with respect to compliance, what we do want to remember is that some other cities are actually enforcing non-use of facial coverings. And what that means is that they're actually um, you know, trying to educate, obviously initially, probably giving warnings, but if folks don't, um, you know, uh, if folks don't abide by those, they're actually enforcing and citing people. And I think that that is a, that is a very big concern um, that folks just won't learn um, and, and, and will continue to endanger themselves and others. And that is a very dangerous thing in a city like ours, because I think our numbers are around, you know, somebody said above 7,000. I think as was said previously, I think the mayor said it, we're gonna be approaching 10,000 very soon. And I think the fact that, you know, we maybe not be as aggressive as we should be since we're the city that's most impacted with the zip codes that have the highest number of cases, I think we do need to look at enforcement and maybe those funds that we recover from enforcement get pumped right back in into education and into, um, into compliance. So that is another thing. The, um, 
uh, other one that um, isn't going to cost anything, but something to consider when it comes to the line item uh, involving sanitation of high risk areas or sanitization of high risk areas. I think we want to uh, include something and because we do have a very large um, unsheltered population. And unfortunately, you know, they are probably the most vulnerable to exposure there, you know, to the extent that we can consider um, some, um, you know, mobile, whether it's, um, you know, hand washing stations, something where, you know, these folks who are, are who are here and in our presence and are going to be sharing the public right of way with us, whether it's a sidewalk, whether it's a street, whether it's any other public place, um, to the extent that they have an, a place that they can um, sanitize themselves and wash their hands and, and keep themselves as clean as possible. That is less exposure to them, but it's less exposure to the general public that is housed. So something for us to think about there on, on that line, line item. The other one was on, you know, distance learning and Wi-Fi. I know it's been mentioned before. I was doing a little simple math. I remember when we presented this, I think I brought this up as an 85A. We kind of estimated that there were about 10,000 households out there that didn't have access to um, uh, Wi-Fi or the internet. And, you know, I know that there were some providers that were providing, you know, um, service uh, uh, for a short term of, you know, even five to $10. And if you do the math of $5, 10,000 households, that's $50,000 a month. If we wanted to provide it for the uh, fall academic semester, that is $300,000 that we could use towards that to augment what the, um, what the school district is doing, but to the extent, Madam City Manager, you have some, um, you know, fruitful, good faith discussions with the uh, superintendent. I think, you know, you've heard it now uh, a few times from us. We certainly want to help and not, you know, maybe do replicate what's being, being done by the school district, but augment and supplement what they're doing. So um, that was that. Uh, the other one that isn't going to cost much, but is part of the um, line item that you mentioned regarding community clinics. Um, you and I, I believe, were both on um, on a couple of calls with the um, with the county um, uh, public health director and Latino Health Access that was retained by the county to provide some services. Um, I know they call themselves the um, uh, Promotoras, and they do mobile testing. So, to the extent that we can work with them, and I know we've had a, a difficult time re-engaging because I think they're in the process of doing mobile testing every other day in Anaheim and in Santa Ana, but they already have a system. And to the extent we can partner with them, as I think a school board member had mentioned that spoke earlier, you know, even providing, you know, some um, uh, alleviation of citations while, you know, some of their volunteers and staff are, are you know, are working and providing these services, physicians and others, um, you know, these are things that we can partner with them um, to make sure that just the logistics work well. Um, so I think that is almost everything. Um, oh, I'm sorry. The last thing that one, the one that I would like us to consider, and that was mentioned, I think a few times, and I think I've mentioned it in the past, is uh, the eviction defense fund. Because as we are looking at, um, you know, providing um, uh, uh, three and a half million or more than three and a half million for rental assistance, um, and I think the approach that was mentioned there was to negotiate with some of the landlords to forgive, uh, you know, after maybe negotiating an 80%, 70%, hopefully we have good negotiators on our side, um, to the extent they forgive the balance of the arrears that are owed on those rents, that's a very, very good uh, approach. But I think there, uh, um, you know, I think there are some landlords um, that are bad actors and, are, and that are using self-help and um, uh, evicting folks um, in violation of not just our executive orders, but the state's executive orders. I think that we have a really good template model that we've used for uh, the deportation defense fund. It doesn't, it's not a high ticket item, but to the extent that folks are gonna need relief um, going into court and trying to plead their case alone, usually they lose. But to the extent that uh, they have somebody that represents them, there's a very high uh, chance that they prevail. And what happens there, we keep folks in their home. These folks are not going to be displaced. We have people that are going to continue to do uh, commerce here in our city. They're going to continue to have their kids attend schools and they're going to stabilize our neighborhoods. But if people start getting mass evictions or being removed from their homes, uh, we destabilize neighborhoods, we destabilize the city. So just some things for uh, us to consider. And, um, and uh, those are my comments for now. Thank you for uh, presenting this, and um, and uh, I want to listen to some Mama. of the other comments from our colleagues. 
Thank you for that uh, very thoughtful discussion, uh, Councilmember Sarmiento. Uh, who else wants to speak? Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Becerra. <laughs> Go ahead, Councilmember. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I wanted to begin by thanking our city manager and all those that participated in the city's COVID-19 task force for bringing all these proposals forward. I know you guys put in a lot of hard work and it's a difficult task given everything that we're facing. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Uh, also, I wanted to thank uh, Planning Commissioner Ty Fan for her comments regarding uh, us prioritizing the rehiring of our city workers. I know some of my colleagues have already talked about it, you know, as we had to lay off many workers due to the impacts from COVID. Uh, I hope that we're able to bring back as many of them as possible uh, to perform some of these tasks that we will uh, see performed uh, with this funding. Um, I appreciate that we are, you know, enhancing our testing. I think it's obviously very important given what we're facing in this pandemic. Um, being able to provide services that are both mobile and at fixed lo locations is truly going to help our community. Um, having our public spaces sanitized by a business that is Santa Ana based is a great way, a great use of this funding. Um, and enhancing the safety in our public facilities that unfortunately have had to remain open through much of this pandemic, such as the public counters at City Hall. Uh, this will protect our residents and our city employees, especially those employees that have had to have direct contact with the public. Uh, I appreciate the two and a half million in business grants that are being made available so that they can be used for furthering operations that have proven successful and essential for businesses facing these orders that have come down from the governor to address the pandemic, such as outdoor dining uh, in downtown. And I think, you know, as we get hopefully closer to towards the end of this pandemic, we should really consider what our policy is going to be when it comes to these setups. When I look at, you know, what we see, for instance, on Third Street today, I think that, or and Fourth Street as well, there are places where you almost have to wonder, could we really benefit as a city by having these particular segments of streets closed off to vehicular traffic and really be reoccupied by the residents and folks that are just enjoying the beautiful weather that we, we have always been able to enjoy pandemic or no pandemic. Um, I did have one question for staff and that was in regards to the rental assistance. I love what I heard in regards to the idea of um, helping folks with 80% of their rent because we would then have the landlords forgive the remaining 20%. But I seem to remember there was some sort of uh, similar emergency legislation that was making its way through Sacramento that sounded very familiar to this. And I just wanted to ask, did that legislation not um, make it through? Uh, is this meant to enhance that? I just want to understand because I think the concept when I first heard it as it was going through Sacramento sounded amazing, but I just want to see where this particular proposal lies in relation to that. I'm sorry, sir. I'm not aware of what legislation that is out of Sacramento. I know it was the, the interdepartmental task force brainstorming on the best way to get the most for the rental assistance dollars that they thought, well, we have a lot of large uh, rental communities in our city and potentially the best way is approaching that, that property owner or the property management. And they did reach out and they have already made a number of calls and there is an interest in it. Um, I can certainly research to find out what legislation you're speaking of. I appreciate that. Yeah, because I, I think that maybe if there's a way to, you know, if, if there's funding already being made available, that the, what you're proposing would enhance that. Because as we heard from uh, folks that called in today, there's obviously going to be a wave of um, of folks that are going to be evicted, and we need to be able to address that. So, you know, any way that we can make these dollars go further to help our our residents, that would be appreciated. Um, and other than that, that's all the comments I have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and if I could the comments? attorney mayor, I just Go I ahead. would just mention I believe just for staff and we can do some follow up because I'm not aware of the status, but I believe council member may be referring to SB 1410, which was um, some emergency legislation, and I can assist staff in finding out the status. Thank you, Sonia. Thank Senator. you. Other comments, council members. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I think uh, Councilmember Mendoza yeah. and I uh, are remaining. Uh, Councilmember Mendoza, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you, Councilmember Solorio. My question is um, on the contract for the nurses hotline, is that a um, for a certain amount of time or did I, uh, I was trying to see if I saw uh, the date through which these funds were to be used through, was it December of 2020? And, and then the follow-up question was, what will happen if we need to go beyond December 2020? Those are excellent questions, council member. Um, currently, the deadline, uh, what we are told is, we more than likely will receive 50% of the money and we have to give a status report in September. And if they like what we're doing with it, we'll receive the other 50%. But at this point in time, all funds have to be expended by the end of the calendar year, so by the end of December, unless that federal legislative has passed, which adds an extension on time. Um, in regards to the nurses hotline, oh good, she does have the information for it. Um, it is based on a six-month term, which would basically, we, it would bridge us to the end of December. We can lengthen it on a second term, but the challenges are going to be extending any of these programs beyond, beyond December is with what funding. Okay. And my other uh, concern with that one was that um, it, it, it is uh, specific to Santa Ana residents, and so there will be verification of an address of somehow. Just wanting to make sure that um, our residents are the ones who are going to be benefiting um, and not something like when uh, we had callers from calling in from all over the world into our, into our city council meetings. And my other question is related to the COVID-19 testing. Have we had any vendors submit uh, their proposals and what's the status on can that coming to council so that we could select someone right away and to make sure that our, our residents are tested um, as soon as possible because time is of the essence and we need to ensure that we have that available sooner rather than later and to ensure that the vendor a, a vendor contract includes um, uh, tracing, contact tracing, that is very important, and that the testing is FDA approved. And so what's the status on the selection of a vendor? So certainly we, um, as you can imagine, we've been, we've received a lot of proposals, a lot of companies out there that say that they can do testing, and uh, we've been venting all of them through our, we've been using our procurement that we've set up in our emergency operations center. Uh, we want to make sure that the contractor that we do select is FDA authorized. The testing kit that they're using is one that is uh, the best to determine whether someone is positive. So we have, we narrowed it down to three, and we've been vetting those, and we're very close to selecting a top vendor. I have had the opportunity, and we weekly calls with the county and oftentimes Dr. Cho joins those calls and he's the medical health officer for our county. So I've been asking him a lot of questions on it saying, okay, this company claims that they have a PCR test that's an instant read. Is there such a thing? You know, can that company deliver on that? And we're finding as we dig a little bit deeper, some of the proposals are not, uh, they don't have the, the capacity to do what they initially had uh, committed to. But I do hope within the next couple of days to make a selection based on all of the vetting that we're doing. It would not require us coming back to the council because through the executive order, you've uh, provided me the authorization to execute those agreements. But if that is certainly of interest to you, I can uh, send you an email, let you know which ones we're, uh, we're leaning towards and which ones we think are the best ones to go forward. So if you wanted to provide me any input, I'd welcome that. Yes, I think that would be great, and perhaps not just to me, but to the other council members so that we can all be on the same page on that. Certainly. Thank you. Any uh, other comments? Uh, I think Councilor Delario is next. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, City Manager Christine Ridge and her very able staff. Uh, I'm looking at Daisy and, and Steve and... Uh, Daniel and everybody else, uh, you know, working for a special district that just handles water and wastewater and doing some amount of this 
work in coordination, I know what a mountain of details and logistics and paperwork and tracking and logistics that there are. So um, I appreciate the work. That's why this far I haven't, you know, given you a million recommendations because I know even just you putting this together and making it in a way that is implementable is, is a big deal. So I want to let you know I appreciate that. Uh, consistent with some of the other speakers, I think, when we can hire back uh, part-timers or other employees that currently aren't working, I think we should. I know from some research that I've done of other cities, the kind of things that they're having uh, extra work do are things like uh, extra cleaning tasks, temperature checking, uh, checking for COVID-19 compliance. Uh, with masks at parks, security, and, and, and checking in at other locations. Um, so there's a lot that could be done there. Uh, for me overall, really, of this whole program, for me what I value the most is the rental assistance, the Wi-Fi, and business grants. Uh, at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, can people pay rent? Can they put foot on the table? And if we don't get uh, our businesses... Uh, to stay alive, we're really going to be hurting financially in, in years to come. And so an investment there really is an investment into our city uh, in the short term and, and, and long term. Uh, and then Wi-Fi, we've talked about distance learning. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I, I like that there was discussion about the high-risk uh, resident testing and outreach. And I think for part of that, what I'd like to see is what are, in addition to you know, zip codes and the type of folks, there are some that are hypersensitive, like uh, assisted living facilities, senior centers, maybe folks where you know, there's other residential programs like that. We really should know what those things are and how they're doing, just because in particular, like at, at uh, assisted living uh, places, there's been you know, rampant outbreaks uh, that think contribute to problems elsewhere, uh, but I appreciate uh, that. And then that also combines with throughout uh, seniors. You know, I want to have a consistent theme of calling out and thinking about our seniors because they're the most vulnerable. Oftentimes, they really are sheltered in place by themselves, and they are limited in technology and, 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 and phone and, and just communications. Um, Wi-Fi, a couple things there. Number one, I know that uh, Senator Lena Gonzalez has a piece of legislation regarding uh, Wi-Fi and tech access. If we haven't, as a city, already done a letter of support for Senator Gonzalez legislation, I think we should. Uh, and any ideas that we have to get more of those dollars to uh, counties or cities like ours, I think that would be good. Uh, I've, I've, I've been clear, whether it be with COVID money or the youth fund money, that we ought to partner with our school districts and schools and larger nonprofits like Discovery. Uh, we, to this day, have $7 million approximately in our youth fund just collecting dust. Uh, meanwhile, the past two, three years, we've spent the cannabis revenue for city operations, police departments, and overall for these three primary areas, rental assistance, Wi-Fi, and business grants, we just got to get money out the door. And really, these three, four months I was doing the math, you know, they ideally want us to spend, like, all the money, like, by December. And because we're already in August, we really only have, like, three or four months to spend $28 million. And again, being in government, it's not easy spending that kind of money with logistics and agendas and approvals, uh, bids and everything else. So uh, those things are very important to me. Um, I think uh, City Manager Ridge was also uh, hinting at Verizon statewide program. It was initially just a program with LA Unified to subsidize the rates that kids and low-income people could use. But they've now made that a statewide program that any agency can pretty much piggyback on. Uh, with libraries, I like the idea of making those hubs also for connectivity. Um, and I don't like that it's always generally viewed as we have two libraries, but just for fuller disclosure, um, we really have more than that. We have uh, obviously our main library. We have the New Hope Library. We also have the Joint Use Roosevelt Walker Library. So that's really a third library that we have. Uh, and then the McFadden Old Library, it's now used as a uh, a PAL center, and I think we could do programming there. Uh, I think with both our city manager and uh, uh, our new library director, I've hinted at that. It still looks like a library, feels like a library, uh, and there's a lot of apartments there. Uh, so it would be very well used in terms of more Wi-Fi or gadgets or other things. Uh, 
rental assistance, I mentioned that. Uh, legal defense fund, I'm not saying no, but I think it's easier said than done, and we gotta find all the right checks and balances and what attorneys or nonprofits are. I always prefer in-house. You know, Why not contract an attorney that all they do is help us answer this? Because I know we get a lot of questions. I know Steve gets questions. I know uh, uh, Hudson gets questions on a lot of these housing laws and issues, whether we like it or not, and they need support. I know sometimes you know it takes them time to respond, and that's just because they have to track down one of our attorneys or outside, and they would be very, very helpful. The nurse hotline, uh, I think, is good. On that one, you might want to think about how you scale. I know in talking to uh, somebody who works for Latino Health Access that they're calling center, the main calls that they're really getting is all these forms on how to register for these tests are in English. So the main question and need that they get online uh, in Spanish, and I'm sure in Vietnamese, is assistance on how to, what does this mean and how to fill in the online form. Uh, so something as simple as that really is what you need. And that, again, could be an SEIU job. I don't think it needs to be a nurse. Uh, and so just kind of monitor that. Maybe check in with Latino Health Access or comparable hotlines, but I think you'll, you'll see that. The child care thing, uh, uh, I agree, you know, and I know Councilmember Villegas brought this up in the past. That's a big need, and I know the state and the governor, they're trying to beef that up and figure out how to do better, so appreciate that. Uh, I like the idea, Christine, and knows a little bit more of an asterisk. Uh, I think there are some more substantial nonprofits uh, that need more support than just the 10,000 uh, because of the number of jobs they do create or their icons and marketing icons to our city. Uh, so I'm very open to that concept. I'm not, letting, you know, I'm not saying which ones they ought to be, but just that I think there's merit to that idea. Arts in the Parks, I know there was an art mention. One of the things I liked about when I previously have heard and talked about arts is if we could put them in, the, in, in parks, you know, with crafts, People don't need to chair crafts, they can take them home. Also artist inspiring. A lot of what everybody does to is also very techy. So for people that are into arts or something else, I think uh, that is a good thing. Uh, businesses and restaurants, I know we like to focus a lot on the downtown because we're in the downtown uh, and to get more traffic, but we can't ignore the rest of our businesses and other parts of the city where the information on, on how they can do restaurant outdoor isn't reaching them as quickly. So whatever we could do to partner with the chamber or other groups uh, on that, I think that would be good. As part of that, uh, very important is reimbursement or pushing technology that's touchless. I think if we can encourage more restaurants to use touchless technology, that also means uh, more convenient forms of payment. And more convenient forms of payment also means easier auditing and sharing of information and resources with um, all, all the agencies that like to receive information on sales. Uh, so I think that is very, very critical. And then I would close just by saying, um, I, I know, Christine, uh, now and then you provide us updates, but I think this is critical enough for the whole community that maybe you could provide a monthly update. Uh, at a minimum, a receiving file, uh, but maybe in your closing report, always there's a page or two with any highlights, or I know you're excellent uh, with dashboards. Uh, I think with new programs that you've started, the dashboards are excellent. I think more traditional things like in our police department, people struggle with getting information and a lot of issues over there. Uh, but I know with uh, things moving forward, it's easier to do that. So with that, I, I thank you greatly, and I'll, I'll follow up separately on, on many of these items. And uh, I just really want to close with distance learning, Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, I have family members that just went through K-12, and, you know, we have educators in our family, and it's a problem. I mean, I, I foresee that we're going to have a fall where half the kids aren't checking into their classes. And it's not all tech issues, much of it is tech issues. And it's not all hardware either. Some people need help just on, should I sign up with Spectrum or AT&T or do I get a mobile hotspot? And you know that's something that is, is important as well. And again, I view it as we have a ton of money here in CARES COVID Act money, and we have $7 million in our youth fund that uh, you know I know our city manager you know, is, is, is get into better and better conversations with the superintendent. Uh, and I you know, really encourage a partnership on that uh, as soon as possible, you know, in the million plus uh, program. And again, 
I agree with uh, Councilmember Peñalos and others that to the extent that we can first maximize things through our libraries, et cetera, that would be great. But as we've also talked about before, the governor isn't letting us open a lot of other facilities. And so the districts and the schools have access to the kids, and we've got to work through them. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, if, uh, if I may, I'd like to make a, a few comments here. I think others have spoken. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, every single member of the city council. Um, I think the, your thoughts and comments uh, are all excellent, and I, I mean that. Uh, you know, uh, Councilman Peñalos, uh, you know, what uh, Mendoza said, you know, Becerra, um, you know, right now, you know, Jose's comments, uh, you know, Councilor Sarmiento, um, you know, Villegas, uh, everybody, every member of the council, I think, is um, uh, in tune and, and working hard. Uh, and I think showing the community that, you know, how much we all care about our, our beautiful city. And, um, and, and to Christine, I know this has uh, been tough. I mean, she came here to run a city. She didn't come here to be a city manager to take on a pandemic, um, but that's what she's had to do. Um, and to all the different department heads, um, I know I've spoken to many of you at different times about, you know, what this means and what we do and how we handle it. Uh, and I think folks are rising to the occasion, uh, in particular that, that task force uh, and the vigor and the energy and the uh, empathy uh, which uh, you know they're they're working with they're they're really working hard to make a difference, um, and I know that uh, you know folks like uh, you know Daisy um, uh, Perez. I mean the way she has thrown herself into this, it's like it can be any hour of the day or night, and and the work goes on, um, and in particular the work with the other big city mayors. Because uh, you know she's had the opportunity to work with many staffs as well as our city manager from other cities uh, up and down California, and I think that that has given us a little bit of a nudge, a little bit of additional information, a little bit of best practices, and I think you see it uh, in the plan that's been uh, put forth, um, and also the uh, Orange County uh, mayors, uh, different group from the big city mayors, but. Everybody's trying to do their part, and, and really, ultimately, we can't do well until we all do well. Um, you know, we do have city boundaries, but the virus doesn't recognize those. Uh, and, and there's so much uh, interaction that ultimately we have to work uh, as a region. Um, so a big thank you to everybody. Um, another area I want to talk about here briefly is on the testing um, I think we have to have testing with a purpose. It's not just the numbers, but it's, you know, what do you do with the information? Uh, I think, unfortunately, the county has lost all control, um, and they just look at general numbers and try to predict things. But, you know, they, they went from uh, really uh, a containment uh, strategy to just playing defense and mitigating very early on. And part of what I think we need to do is get control uh, back as much as we can. Um, and what I mean by that is if we do test somebody who's positive, um, let's try to do you know, contact tracing so we can trace all the people that they came in contact and test them. Um, and that's where this testing becomes effective, but it's gotta have a quick turnaround. Unfortunately, right now across much of the nation, the lag time is so great that the results are almost meaningless because by the time you find out if you are positive and you tested two weeks ago, look at all the people you impacted. And if you were not positive and you tested two weeks ago, you know, you, you really, uh, you know, beat yourself up. Um, and what I mean in particular by that is a lot of, of the community um, that tests positive, they are not allowed to go back to work. And many of these are, you know, uh, you know, the breadwinners of the home. And if you have, you know, uh, you know, the no money and the inability to work, even though you have a job, 
but but they don't want you to go work because they don't want you to infect other workers. Now you're in a really bad spot. And 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 if you have to go and you have to retest and it takes two weeks for the test to come back, it can be a nightmare. It can be a real real nightmare where where a lot of unintended uh, circumstances uh, uh, and events occur, and, and and one bad thing becomes ten bad things, and now you've got the whole family infected. And I know you know several of you mentioned you know uh, you know transmission and 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 masks and all. Well, that is I think the magic of 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 the mask that even in the home, if you have an, an infected individual, anybody with symptoms or you know you need to you know do things within the home and and some of those things are things like putting up sheets potentially to to create spaces that are segregated within a room um often it means wearing masks indoors and that's an awful thing to do you know put on a mask for several hours and you go crazy but you know not wearing a mask you could be killing people i mean I've run in a lot of folks say it's my right not to wear a mask. And part of what I tell them is, look, it's not your right to hurt people. You might be killing somebody. And, 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 and by wearing a mask, you might be saving a life. And that life could be your own, but it could very likely be other people that you're, you're saving. And so, you know, with this mask up uh, effort that we are all uh, been a part of, uh, it's starting to work. I can tell you that across the state, um, we'll know more in the next two to three weeks because whenever you do something, it takes about four weeks for the real results to become apparent, the ramifications of vaccines. You know, by the time people get infected, those that are serious, they go to the hospital. Those that, that, that can't handle it die. You know, there's a big lag period. But I'll tell you that, you know, since the most recent, uh, uh, you know, shutdown pretty much here in the state, the numbers are turning around, but we need to do more in, in Santa Ana because we have a greater infection rate in Santa Ana. We have greater density and we have greater uh, ability to transmit. Uh, and, and, and therefore these efforts that we're making, um, you know, are not a moment too soon. Uh, you know, again, unfortunately the county is not cooperating. Um, next thing I'm gonna try to do, I'm trying to, get all the mayors in the county, but every single one of you council members can also do whatever you can to help. We need to get data from the county that shows, you know, precincts, that shows infection by precinct. We don't need the individual's name. We don't need an individual's address. We're not trying to embarrass anybody or cause harm, but if we don't have any idea where they are, um, it's a real problem. You know, whenever we have a sex offender, we all go crazy and it's like, where are they? You know, let's keep people safe. Um, this is not unsimilar in that sense. If you have people that are sick and they're shedding and they're contagious, this is not a disease that respects anything and, and not privacy laws, not, you know, HEPA, not anything else. And so I think we have to convey to the county that you know, in order for us to use this money wisely, uh, and, and yes, I agree with everything that was said about, you know, rental assistance and, and connectivity, uh, internet, et cetera. But if we don't get control of the virus itself, and if we don't bring our infection rate down, we're gonna be here a year from now, and nobody's gonna save us. You know, everybody will have gotten tired, uh, you know, revenues will be down, uh, you know, you know, we'll have concessions from, uh, you know, labor unions, but that won't be enough. Um, you know, the budget will not be balanced. Um, and it's all because we don't have revenues and we don't have revenues because businesses can't function. They can't function because we have the virus. So we have to somehow through all this do everything, including not losing uh, sight of who the real enemy is here and the real enemy here uh is the virus so so with that um thank you for uh indulging me and and um uh at this point i know we have a uh, a lot of notes that i'm sure the manager has uh you know written and uh, what i'd like to do is uh, uh you know possibly just go with staff recommendation and then 
tell her to come back, communicate with all of us about everything. She's very good at doing that. Um, I think yes, reports possibly at the end of the council meeting or whatever are, are appropriate, you know, for the uh, for folks that are watching on TV and all that. Um, but I would suggest that through memos and emails um, and and the Nixle reports that she does and other things that there can even be more frequent, uh, uh, significant uh, communication going back and forth between the manager uh, and the city council. Um, so with that, uh, is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second, and, and I agree, Mr. Mayor, I think because part of the action is to give the city manager authority to move money around, even including between departments, that she'll take all this input, do the best she can, and then uh, you know, stay in touch with us. Thank you. And, and she'll get back to, uh, yeah. to all of us. Yeah. This is a seven member council um, with, you know, uh, really a lot of similar input. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, here we really do have to hang together uh, and we have to push hard. You know, the future of the city really is at stake. Um, so, uh, so with that, uh, is it okay with folks if I ask for a roll call vote? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, really quick, this is Councilmember Penaloza. Um, I just wanted, sure. I just wanted to, to clarify with the last, um, with the last part of the uh, recommended recommended action to authorize the city manager to move the appropriation between departments within the CARES Special Revenue Fund to adjust as needed for residents' actual use of each program. Um, I just wanted to ask clarification of the city manager. Will we be, uh, if this is part of the motion, will we be briefed ahead of time or a memo, uh, a daily, weekly memo, since I know this is only, I mean, this is only a three-month period where we're going to be uh, spending this money. Um, can you just talk a little bit about Can you speak to that? Yeah, can you talk to that, Madam City Manager, please? Um, certainly. Um, I most definitely can. And with the frequent communication and the status of all of our efforts, I can add that to that um, report. Yeah, if we so could I can add. Tell you if uh, we're if, overspending in one department and I need to adjust, right. I can provide you all the details. And because it's only three months, I would ask, and you're probably going to hate me uh, for weekly updates. Uh, maybe by the end of the week, I know you do a city manager, not to the, to the whole city, but I mean uh, to us or bi weekly. Uh, so that we could um, get these updates frequently and uh, accurately every time that there are changes that need to be made. Um, with the, and I'm not sure if the, if the motion was the recommended actions on the staff report. Uh, yes, yes, it is. And we can do it with that clarification and let's see if she can't do it weekly. Hopefully it's and not too much of a burden. Should Should the, and maybe this is a question for the city attorney, but should somebody maybe the city manager should you are you including because but most of us did agree on a lot of these things are, are those is that going to be as included as part of the motion um do you want to read those a summary of, if you can best describe what the changes that we because i know there were some changes in what could be allowed and what can't be allowed in the assistance we're providing for residents. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, certainly. So I believe what the, the motion would be is to approve the appropriation adjustment for the full $28.6 million, uh, give general approval for the proposed care spending, spending plan with the additional direction that was provided by each of you at tonight's meeting, and including weekly uh, progress reports on the results and provide authorization for the city manager to move appropriations, but with notification to the entire city council. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, if appropriate, I'd like to call a roll call vote, Madam Clerk. Council Member Becerra. <coughs> yes. Council Member Mendoza. Yes. Council Member Peñalosa. Yes. Council Member Sarmiento. Aye. Council Member Solorio? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Vegas? Aye. Mayor Pulido? Yes. Motion carries. So that's on. unanimous. Uh, I, you know, congratulations to the council, and I, I thank all of you uh, for this effort, and we've got our work uh, cut out. $28 million sounds like a lot of money, but for what we're talking about, believe me, it's really very little money. We could be 
using a whole lot more and putting it all to good work. Uh, so with that, uh, is there anything else on the agenda, Madam City Manager? No, that's all, sir. All right, Mayor, any Mayor, closing comments? Mayor, there is an adjournment in memory of. Uh, of uh, two individuals, I believe, right? Rob Richardson? Yes, and Eugene Harbrech. Let's go ahead and, uh, and adjourn. Um, and because Rob was a former council member for eight years and all, I'd like to ask that you know, may we uh, uh, you know send whatever is appropriate. Uh, I know you know flowers, um, you know something on behalf of the city council. He he not only served on the school board, but he was the council member for eight years as well. Mr. Mr. Mayor, a little bit related to that. I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but the the courtyard at the train station is named in his honor. Uh, maybe there could be like an updated tribute or, or sign there or something, but um, that might be something to think about, or maybe we could leave some flowers there. You know, there's there's something there because people think of that place other than Norms and Polly's uh, for Rob, but I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, may we just suggest that the city manager consider something there. I know Rob, Rob loved frames, um, and he used to, you know, go to actually, he was a foamer. I don't know if you want to know what a foamer is, but they, they say they foam at the mouth when they see a train, <laughs> and they, they, wear, they wear their pants very high with a belt on the outside. Um, and uh, they know everything about trains, but <laughs> Rob was a wonderful, wonderful guy. And uh, look, I could go on a long time about Rob. So with, with that, let's just send prayers to him and uh, take care of each other and realize we have a big job ahead of us here in the next several uh, you know, days and weeks to come. Uh, try to take care of all our employees and, and, and our community. Um, and just figure out how we keep the city moving forward. So with that, uh, this meeting is adjourned.